Que ahora, good morning, hola a todos, buenos días. This is our third panel discussion of Here and Out, and it's street art uh, producers and creators. Um, my name is Mirela Mosquela, and I'm a, a street art videographer from Peru and the creator of Here and Out. Que ahora, bonjour, my name is Wolf, uh, Gerardin Jordouin. I'm a Canadian artist and the digital manager of Here and Out. Welcome. Here and Out is an exhibition and mini festival, the result of a series of reflections based on the journeys of nine seamless varieties from five different countries during the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. A multimedia exhibition where variety and resilience are keywords to understanding the content of the show and the synergy of this woman with more than a decade of experience living murals on the streets of Peru, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Belgium, Hong Kong, Aotearoa, the United States, and many, many more. This project features the work of Dreamwares, Dream Cares Collective, composed of Tina Keel, Miriam Gray Smith, and Zoe Hall from Wellington, New Zealand, Plura from Christchurch, New Zealand, Janine Williams from Auckland, New Zealand, Paula Tikai from Santiago de Chile, Caratoes from Belgium, Flash Hong Kong, Meki from Lima, Peru, and Gleo from Cali, Colombia. We know that public space is changing since technology allows us um, social interactions that isn't just physical anymore. This project has been shaped in a way that can go farther than the geographical space in which the exhibition is taking place. Finding new ways for collective thinking and creative, creating in the digital realm, a powerful tool to stay close in times where society requires to stay apart. Welcome to our third panel discussion, street art producers and creators. We are honored to have to be sharing this space today with such a great panel composed of Jenna and Ingram. Jenna Ingram is an artist from Christchurch, New Zealand, with a background in painting from the University of Canterbury. It um, was after the earthquakes that her passion for urban art took physical form in the streets. She and a group of passionate artists founded Fixate Gallery, established in 2015. The space grew from an artist's studio into a fully-fledged gallery hosting exciting and unique urban art exhibitions. Welcome, Jenna. Hi, thanks for having me. And uh, also with us is Sinza Merkins. Um, Sinza is a New Zealand-based multidisciplinary artist, event producer, curator, and father of two, based out of Napier, Hawks Bay. He paints from and for his environment, often expressing his views about pressing environmental issues with a strong sense of color, movement, and balance. Sinza is exhibited extensively throughout New Zealand, also showing works in group shows, festivals, and mural productions in Australia, Mexico, North America, Canada, Japan, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Estonia, and Caribbean. Where is he not painted? Uh, <laughs> he's also responsible for the production, co-production, and curatorial aspects of important street art festivals in New Zealand, such as the International Sea Walls Festival. Welcome, Sinza. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> and Elizabeth um, Ann Doyle uh, is the co-founder, artistic, and general director of MU in Montreal. With nearly 30 years of experience in cultural enterprises, Elizabeth Ann Doyle combines her personal interests and her professional experiences with the MU project. She's been involved with important art institutions like the Place des Arts, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and even the Cirque du Soleil. This work and life experience has allowed her to master the aspects of relations with government authorities, the media, community groups, and sponsors. She specialized in the design and production of special events, mainly for Cirque du Soleil, but also for many prestigious clients. She has thus produced major events in Montreal in major cities such as New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles, Paris, London, Milan, St. Petersburg, Moscow, and more. Her master's degree in history has enabled her to realize the importance of social, economic, and cultural development projects. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. So during the next 55 minutes, each, each panelist will share with us their experiences, their processes, and uh, by the very end, we'll have an open uh, Q&A uh, for those that are following us on the Facebook uh, page of Toy Connect. So welcome, everyone. So now um, uh, we would really like to know more about each of the um, projects you um, lead and the curatorial aspects of them. Uh, so Gina, could you please um, introduce your, uh, Jenna, sorry, can you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us more about your 
your experience um, during these years leading FIXA and even before that, how did you start it with all these um, projects? Massive, amazing gallery in Christchurch. Oh, thanks, Vera. Um, yeah, my um, involvement in urban art really started when I was like at high school and I just fell in love with graffiti. And I think there was something about the freedom and the style and the techniques that just I was so drawn to. Um, at university, I actually didn't really have a very good experience with um, my tutor or fine art. So I went away from art altogether, went to music where I was um, in the drum and bass scene. I I'd started emceeing and that was another creative outlet. But then um, when the earthquakes happened in Christchurch, um, there was something that just was like a drawing, like we had to do something and urban art was a way of doing something. And so in a way I thought I was helping the city by doing these like urban art um, in installations. Um, so from, from that um, we got to take part in Spectrum, which was in 2015. And we worked with Ruben and Clint and my husband, Nathan. Um, we did the paste up sticker room and, um, and we, we worked so well together that we started a gallery. It was a studio space first, an art studio space, and, and we just decided to have a gallery in the front. And um, and, and it just grew. And we, we sort of saw this gap where urban artists weren't being represented. And we believed, you know, that they were worth representing. Like, this art form is amazing. Um, you know, that there was sort of that hierarchy with galleries where you needed a piece of paper to say, you know, what, what your art's about and why it's good. But with urban art, it's just so um, obvious to well, to me how good it is, how, how talented they are. And um, yeah, so Fixate grew from, from that really. And um, we've been doing it, yeah, five years. And um, every show we do, um, you know, the, the joy of working with the artists is really why we keep doing it and, um, yeah, giving them that platform. Yeah. So that's, that's about it, really. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, Pixar is a really interesting um, project of space. I haven't been in the new one, but I remember the exhibition um, perspective that was actually also, all female street artists um, mm -hmm. from New Zealand and well, a couple from Peru. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I remember the response of the people during the opening, and it was really cool to see because I think that was for me the ver the first experience I had uh, coming into space. It was like, you know, just for a street art, even though it was inside, it was like you can you can uh, feel it. So for me, that was a really cool experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um. I like to think we welcome all all people, you know, into the gallery. Um, even though, you know, some people feel uncomfortable in a gallery setting, we we play music, you know, we we're just there to chat and create a really comfortable environment. Um, so um I guess there's like uh, a mixture of fixate. It's like we've come from I've come from hospo background, retail background, um, the music scene background. So with our openings, like we actually create an event. It's not it's not your run of the mill opening, I don't think. Um, and yeah, we 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 want we want to do it like that. Make it special, make it different, and um, the art can speak for itself. Really, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, sharing with us. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. I look forward to seeing it in person. I haven't been there in Christchurch yet, but I'm excited. Oh, yeah, please do. Come down. <laughs> Thanks. Um, today we're here in Studio 30 in Tokwaneki Gallery in the first here and out panel discussion of the day, Street Art Producers and Curators, in case you just joined us. Um, we're now going to uh, speak with Sinza Merkins, who will tell us about his experience over a decade of painting street, the streets of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and the world and producing events and projects related to street art. So welcome, Sinza. Kota. Hey, how you guys going? Thanks for having me on board. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, much the same as Jenna, I guess, came from a background of painting, painting on the streets. Um, 
I did some study. I went to Elam uh, School of Fine Arts for about a year and then went off in my own direction um, due to actually a back injury and then kind of ended up falling into a space where I um, got the opportunity to set up a studio in a gallery space and then that kind of launched me into more of that world and that scene and met a lot of other painters, um, a lot of kind of, um, yeah, graphers and people that were kind of like based around Auckland um, and um, yeah, much, much the same as Jenna, like always, always had a love for, for painting, had a love for graph and for what was happening on the street in a public space. Um, I think, I guess the, the beauty of, of taking away any boundaries and restrictions of seeing and interacting with art was really important to me. Um, and yeah, that kind of, I guess, propelled and led me into painting more, more street works, um, which yeah, first I guess started out painting kind of illegally and then that, uh, developed and turned more into muralism. Um, and as that scene kind of grew, I got more and more involved in that, um, painting kind of larger walls and so on, um, around the country. And then, um, yeah, I guess, um, from a curatorial perspective, like my skills in that, that arena kind of grew from, uh, running this small little art gallery space with, with the handful of, of misfits, a bunch of mates from, you know, from our teenage years, um, and got some skills around, I guess, like managing artists, um, which I, I guess probably everybody here knows that like, um, sometimes can be a little bit like herding cats. Um, <laughs> we're, not, we're not like the you know, not always the most onto it, most reliable bunch. Um, but you know, that, that kind of, you, you build a, a sense of, I guess, resilience and, um, yeah. And experience of working with all sorts of different people. Um, and from, from that made friends with, you know, with other artists that were doing different things and that led into, um, exhibiting in, in some shows overseas. Um, and that, yeah, an old friend of mine, Aaron Glasson was, um, involved with Pangea Seed and doing the, the, I guess their first exhibition, which was out in Tokyo. Um, and that was raising awareness around shark finning, um, essentially shark finning. Basically it was, it was kind of, yeah, trying to ban shark finning. They just discovered some of these warehouses that were, ex, you know, exposing these like disgusting practices that were happening kind of all over the world. Um, and they raised a, a bunch of different artists from, from all over the world to create works that were, you know, shining a light on this practice. Um, and that kind of grew and grew. It was really well received, but just being a gallery show, it only reached sort of a certain audience, I guess. Um, so the natural progression was for that to go into the streets and a lot of the artists that were exhibiting in those shows that they were putting on, that Panji was putting on in Japan and then following on from that in the States, um, worked with a lot of muralists and graffiti writers and so on. Um, so yeah, one thing led to another and that developed. I guess I could I could harp on for hours about the backstory of Pangea Seed and where, where all that came from. Um, but short story, I guess to, to cut things short, I got invited to go out to the first Seawalls Festival, which was out in Ismael Jerez in, in Mexico, out off the coast of Cancun, um, and was an incredible experience, very grassroots. Um, you know, it was kind of like we, you know, I raised, raised the funds um, to get out there myself and then we kind of uh, linked up with, 15 incredible artists from all over the world um, went out on these boats out to the ocean and dived with whale sharks and, you know, had the most amazing experience and then brought that back into the streets and painted about the importance of these species and protecting them and different practices that can be put into play um, from an environmental perspective. But I guess the idea of yeah, bringing art into the streets to give the, the oceans a voice really. Um, so based off the back of that project, uh, I got talking with Trey, who Trey and Akita, who are the, the directors of Pangea Seed that run, run the Seawalls project. Um, and they bounced the idea of bringing that out to New Zealand. And I thought, yeah, amazing. Like, let's, you know, let's do it. Would love to. Um, I had kind of no real solid idea of what my involvement would be in that, apart from, I guess, kind of just being boots on the ground and helping to run around and help you know, curate things and do what I could do from here. Um, and then one thing led to another and then it was about two years of discussions, um, and fundraising and yeah, doing a, a whole lot of kind of prep work on the ground. And then we, we bought Seawalls to New Zealand for the first time back in 2016. Um, and that was in my hometown here where I live in Napier and Hawke's Bay. Um, so we had 39 artists that produced a, yeah, that series of works in Napier, um, which was, yeah, an incredible experience, you know, um, we ran an exhibition, had a panel discussion, uh, had a film festival, 
did like artist ex- excursions. So took all the artists out on like on the Wakahodua, like out on the boats and things to get an, ex- uh, an experience of the ocean. Um, you know, worked with local iwi and, you know, had a beautiful porphyry and um, real kind of cultural excursions um, just to give the internationals, I guess, like a proper feel of, of what's important about, uh, you know, our landscape and our culture and our people here. Um, and then all the artists kind of reflected from those experiences and painted, painted murals. So it was a, a good combination of New Zealand based artists, local, local mus- national based artists and then international. Um, yeah. And then that, that totally transformed the town. It was an amazing experience. Um, you know, we went from being quite a art deco based city, uh, well not city, you know, I mean, we call it a city, but we're lying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, to uh, there were just so many blank canvases, so many beautiful spaces that could be completely transformed and create a whole, you know, a, a whole different look and feel and sense of ownership and identity for the space. Um, and it was incredibly well received. And then based off the back of that, um, people kind of, yeah, rallied up to, you know, want to have the, the festival run the following year here as well. So we did, did it again in 2017. Um, so I think we've got about 52 public works or seawalls murals in Napier. Um, and yeah, that went really well as well. And then the following year we took it up to tide up to, up to Gisborne, um, and a good friend of mine, Kelly Spencer ran that, that event up that way. Um, and I came more involved from an operations level. Um, and yeah, one thing's led to another thing over the, over the years and, you know, I've been very fortunate to be invited to go out as a guest artist and paint or to help, um, manage operations and, you know, work, work in ops with, with a very um, skilled crew set, you know, kind of around the world, painting on different festivals and and yeah, running logistics and so on. Um, but yeah, that's no, been an amazing experience. Um, and I think is a very valuable, I think, you know, I guess everybody here could speak about the value of public art and what that adds to a space um, for, you know, for everybody that interacts with that space. So um, something I hold very close to my heart and obviously, you know, it's my career as well. I paint murals. So um, yeah, that's, I guess, more, more or less me. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, it's amazing. The, the meaning and purpose behind SeaWorld, like since the street art creates this global connected community on social media online, you know, sharing images all the time. It's really cool how this festival, like kind of, direct all that attention to struggles that we all need to be aware of so that's really really cool (laughs) yeah yeah i think it's you know it's important like there's a lot there's a lot i mean everybody i think specifically in new zealand we're all very connected to the ocean you know it's like it's a huge part of our life you can't escape it you know it's like no matter where you are you're not too far from the coast um and we all grow up with some sort of connection to the ocean and I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people that don't realize what's happening beneath the surface of the ocean. Um, so it's just kind of bringing some of that awareness and in, uh, into public spaces um, and creating works that can act as educational tools um, and hopefully, you know, be a catalyst for, you know, for social and environmental change. Thank you, Cinder. Yeah, it's been a uh... Very interesting um, living here myself. So I get into experience living near the ocean. So, you know, in Montreal, um, if we're in the middle of a river. It's a very different landscape, and the ocean is quite far away. So, yeah, it's been real nice just in Oriental Bay seeing little baby sharks come every now and then, or, or <laughs> jellyfish, or like, you know, seeing different seasons, like dolphins passing through. It's just, yeah, it's incredible. So, <laughs> thank you. <Nice>. Um, <laughs> Uh, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Elizabeth Ann Doyle. She's a key figure in my hometown of Montréal. Bonjour, Elizabeth. Je suis ravi que tu puisses nous joindre aujourd'hui. Merci pour ton intérêt envers Here and Out. Um, um, I'm thrilled that, that we've been able, been able to, to connect with MU because MU has been a key proponent of street art in Montreal for as long as I can remember. Um, MU is responsible for so many great murals. Um, you know, the, the ones in the Habitation Jean Mans, I remember from a young age, like just changing completely the downtown landscape, the huge Leonard Cohen, uh, mural from, uh, El Mac a few years ago, or, um, or just recently the Le Courant, which transformed Saint Denis Boulevard into a gorgeous stream of expression. Um, yeah, yeah. MU represents a lot of Montreal's best muralists, but also supports emerging artists, which I think is awesome. Um, and they help street artists to find walls as well as people who need who have walls who need artists 
um, and making that connection and um, supporting the artists and the and the uh, clients like along the way, uh, be it with getting volunteers to help or, or uh, helping financially or, you know, just making things happen. Um, and they also organize youth workshops and to get the, the young, uh, young ones to like get involved with arts and, you know, potentially uh, see that you can pursue that as a career. Um, yeah. And MU is entirely female led, which is awesome. I think it really aligns with the here and now's vision of, uh, you know, how the culture is changing and yeah, it's, it's great. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Elizabeth, the co-founder and director of MU to share us, with us some of her experience in the field. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for having me. So yeah, we're actually celebrating our 15th anniversary this year. So that's why, Wolf, you, you remember it for so long in your life. <laughs> um, so it, it started out not, you know, having such a, of a grand vision, um, but we're basically inspired by the city of Philadelphia. Um, me and my friend used to work for Cirque du Soleil. We were on tour in the States and um, witnessing projects that were art related um, towards social, social change, um, which is what Cirque um, wanted to do with um, their social engagement projects in within communities. So we discovered this, this mural project in Philadelphia in 2000. Uh, which was amazing. Um, Cirque du Soleil since um, funded a few murals and I was left witnessing how murals and street art were contributing to, to social change in the community, how communities could have a voice, how they could identify, take pride and stuff. And, and that's values that you know, stayed with me. Years passed on and I left CERC, uh, but still was really connected with the organization. And then we decided to, to start one mural um, in Cirque du Soleil's neighborhood as a kind of a one-off. Um, and then it just grew from there. So 15 years later, we're um, close to 200 large scale murals in the city of Montreal, but more than 500 um, community uh, murals with uh, youth at risk or teenagers in schools and community centers and stuff, which is um, kind of our our reason for existing. So we're a charitable nonprofit organization, actually, um, based on the education programs that we have linking um, teenagers and youth and young emerging artists to potential opportunities in the arts world. Um, so I'm proud to say that in 15 years, we're close to $3 million that were given back to artists as fees. Um, so giving a lot of job opportunities and mentorship opportunities for um, art students. And so we have like a brigade every summer of like a, a dozen emerging artists um, studying in fine arts in different Montreal universities and being able to come and assist, uh, whether it's on mural projects or in arts education projects um, within community arts. So it's cool. I'm, I'm proud of what we've achieved. And yes, we're a women-led organization. Um, so we also tend to support and try to um, give opportunities to young women artists since um, street art is and graffiti arts is, is kind of a historically a, a male driven um, area of expertise, I would say. So we're, we're trying to uh, give opportunities to young girls and women who would like to develop their skills and have a voice in, in public area. Um, so yeah, we, we, we work, I mean, in Montreal, the summer is really short. So we do have a only three months 
out of the year period where we can produce public art um, outdoors. Um, but we do um, work a lot within um, schools and community centers and with youth driven projects indoors throughout the year. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point about, um, you know, Montreal with the, with the, the climate of being like, yeah, you really got to make the summers count and try to get as much work as, as you can. And it's amazing how much you have done in 15 years. It's incredible. Um, and I guess, you know, sometimes winter is good for getting to think about which projects you're going to do in the summer and, you know, get it all prepared. Um, so yeah, no, and, and, it's just amazing everything that you you uh, you built to to support the the various all the communities of, of Montreal and because um, you know I, I feel like I can go in almost any neighborhood and I know that there's, there's some community murals or something that that you've helped activate those neighborhoods and um, yeah it's just a really beautiful beautiful project um, so thank you for you know, thank you well yeah. we've, we've... <laughs> We've tried to really, um, since we're really, you know, based and inspired by by social arts and arts for, you know, as a as a opportunity for social change. Um, basically, we've always um, felt to be apart from like the more um, commercial um, aspect of of street art, um, but more into the I would say traditional family of muralism, um, you know, in, in the 20th century where, um, murals were, were kind of commissioned to uh, act as a, a voice maybe for the unheard or for the people that have, you know, less opportunity to, to have a voice out there. Um, so yes, a lot most of our murals are done in uh, public subsidized housing complexes um, and outside of the, the downtown area. So really to be able to have this kind of um, objective of bring art to the streets uh, in the in the real sense of just, you know, being have have this access to public art in, on a daily basis where in areas where it's it's really off of the grid for public transportation or access to museums and other form of um you know art centers basically so interesting um for those that are joining us on facebook we are in our third panel discussion as street art producers and art curators with an amazing uh, panel um we are here with jenna ingram from fixating christchurch we are here with cinta um an amazing artist and he's part of the sea walls family and also with elizabeth from mu montreal so thank you for those that are following uh, this conversation. And now I would like to ask you, um, uh, I'm really curious about the process uh, behind the curatorial aspects of your projects. So like how or what's the criteria behind the, the selection of artists you choose for your projects? Um, if, Jenna, can you start please? Yeah, sure. Um... So for our gallery, we do have a criteria um, to be able to exhibit with us. And it's it's to, like an artist has to have had or is still currently active in pursuing the creative output in the urban environment. So really it's sort of, it's a, it's a wide branch, but um, they, they must have some sort of background um, in it. And personally, I, I look for artists who are, you know, driven, passionate, uh, are working to promote themselves already, if, if that makes sense. So they've got a dedicated Instagram page. They're, they're pushing themselves um, as much as we would. Um, obviously, you know, there's, there's um, – a skill that that we look for, like the, the actual artworks um, progression. If there's been some evolution in their body of work over the last few years, um, and well, I guess we're pretty lucky in in sort of the urban art um, culture where 
generally these artists are really nice, really humble, really cool to work with. Um, I haven't really come across anyone who has been, you know, like, um, I don't know, a diva or something, I guess <laughs> you call it. Um, yeah, I've just been blown away. Like some of the artists that I looked up to for years, you know, and I'm fangirling and I get to meet them. They're the nicest, most humble people. And, um, yeah, it's just blown me out of, out of the water every time. So, um, yeah, that sort of fixates criteria, really. Ooh. Good art, good people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, what about um Cinza? What about you when you um organized or produced um Sea Wolves? What uh what was your criteria behind the selection of those you said 39 artists? Uh yeah, we've yeah, we've we've, we've had a lot over the years, but um yeah. <laughs> um much like similar similar to Jenna, really, like working with good people, you know, it's like you don't want to work with people that are that are hard work and difficult and divas and and you know, um we've definitely had you know, we've worked with some incredible, amazing people that, um, I mean, most, most, most people, most artists are really like Jenna was saying, are really humble, like great people and pretty easy going and good to work with. Um, but sometimes you get the oddball, which <laughs> is like a spanner in the works, you know? Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a mix, I guess the curatorial process, like, yeah, we want like a really high execution of standard, you know, we want it to be like, like good quality work because it's, it's, you know, living on in a space that people are, are living with and engaging with and interacting with. Um, so you want to be producing like good quality works, um, but also um, a, like a very diverse lineup. We've always tried to have a really, a really good balance between female and male artists, um, you know, having, having, yeah, a, a good mix of, of gender, um, different ethnicities. Um, ultimately it's, it's the work that speaks for itself um, as to, you know, who comes on board. Um with Napier, I wanted to have a solid local lineup, so a good good mix of local painters that are from specifically Hawke's Bay as well as around the country. So 50% of the lineup was from New Zealand, 25% um, of that was locally from Hawke's Bay, and the remainder 50% lineup was internationals that came in. Um, so just bringing a really diverse array of artwork in terms of um, styles, uh, yeah, look, look and feel styles, execution, um, content, um, just so there's kind of something for everybody. Um, yeah. Um, each, each project is kind of different as well. You know, um, I guess it depends on uh, there's technical components of it as well of, of, of who is physically capable of, of turning around, you know, a four story mural in, in a period of seven days or whatever, um, versus, um, you know, who's, who would prefer to just work on the ground, um, your, your skill level and experience working with access equipment. Um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of like technical, uh logistics behind it as well um but we we try to be pretty open-minded as well you know it's like if we, I, the guys get hit up all the time by different artists and it's always great to work with new talent and new people that are you know interested in, in having a voice and, and producing some public work so yeah it's pretty varied really i don't know if that's a straight answer or not <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Elizabeth, would you like to tell us a little bit about the curatorial, curatorial um, sure. process? Well, I'll, I'll definitely um, confirm what Jenna and Siza said. Um, for sure, good are good people. I mean, that's the same for mm -hmm. us too. Um, basically, because we're a, a social arts organization, for sure, the main criteria is really to be open to um, consultation, conversation with communities. So um, there's no blank cards at, at NU. Uh, in Montreal, you, you can't just do whatever you feel like. Um, it's, it's not about you and your art. It's more about what you can share uh and what communities can bring to you as well and what you can offer so it's it's really about um the the conversation so that's super important for us um so i would say that's the the first criteria then um we are really a local organization too so i would say pretty much like 95% of of the artists um that collaborate on murals are 
um, Montrealers. Um, but like I said earlier, we are trying to basically produce more more artists um, that are from Montreal. So trying to, you know, give them opportunities as assistants and then create smaller murals and so they can grow and, and become muralists themselves. So basically try to be like a, a school and a, a, you know, budding ground to uh, to create those amazing artists that because we're, we're a, a very, very creative community in Montreal. So it's kind of um, one of our brandings of the city is is how creative everybody is. So we're just, you know, confirming that and trying to make give opportunities and and uh, and and make for uh, you know for artists to grow in in mural arts since it's not something that you can actually learn in school. Um, and then other than that, since we are education based as well, well, having uh, international artists um, as, you know, invitations and come to share their art with us in Montreal is also amazing because then there there can be um, sharing of knowledge and sharing of experience and mentorship as well. So. Again, um, we are looking for artists that are, you know, amazing and that produce great art, um, but that are open to share it and um, be be mentors as well. So we always say like the process and the result is are as important. Um, you know, obviously the murals stay in the public realm, so they need to be awesome. Um, but the process leading to the result needs to be cool as well and you know um thought of and planned and um careful and respectful of of where we produce the art yeah no i think that that's a a beautiful uh mandate and vision because uh, i know like for myself uh, you know going around door knocking trying to find walls is like very difficult so you know having people uh well organizations like mu that are are there to to facilitate those things and and so much more is just so um yeah important i think for, for artists that are starting out and wanting to to um make murals um yeah, I'm just going to address everyone who's, if there's people that have just joined us now, <laughs> um, this is awkward, but you know, people will drop in and drop out. So welcome, welcome. Um, thanks everyone for joining us in the third panel discussion, street art producers and curators. We are today with Jenna, Sinza, and Elizabeth, curators and producers of impressive street art in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Canada. I have another question. <laughs> I'm really curious this morning because you are doing such a great, like amazing uh, public art project that I want to know more about um, what's behind, like behind the mural, behind an exhibition, behind a festival, there's a lot of work involved. So for you, um, what are the, what are the, the actual um, struggles and how do you go after like, um, overdose and how do you make things happen and how do you get like funding, like the permissions for the like government regulations and um, yeah, how how is all that production uh, process for you in your um, in your projects and spaces? Can you um, tell us more about that, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. But the gallery side of things, like leading up to an exhibition. It, it's months, you know, weeks, if not months worth of work, prep work, um, with um, doing murals and um, organising projects. Again, it's just, it's it's a lot of lead up work, a lot of communication, um, struggles. You know, I, I can talk about one experience I'm having right now where I'm organising uh, for developers, um, a series of four murals with four artists and it's a classic um, case of they don't know what they want until they see it and they know they don't want it yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess it's one of those things like just working with 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 people who um uh you know might say let the artists go for it we really like their style and um they work really hard on a design concept and I show them and um 
they now all of a sudden know what they want and it's not that. So it's it's sort of that that thing. So you've got to um be patient and um work work between parties and be the peacekeeper a bit and um um yeah I guess with exhibition prep in general it's we we've done it so often like it's it's now a bit of a well oiled machine but we close the gallery for a whole week to you know sand and paint the walls and do the layout do all the photography get get everything on the website um there's promotion there's filming um you know i go out and buy a lot of wine <laughs> and <laughs> get a lot of ice and um put on a party so yeah both both are fun and the outcomes always outweigh the struggles and i think that's why we keep doing it you know um it's all learning and um i think doing it for for someone else as well is really what drives me like i'm not this isn't my personal exhibition this isn't my personal sort of uh game it's i'm sort of doing it for that community or doing it for someone so yeah yeah amazing mm-hmm. yeah well um what about you um yeah i mean each each event in terms of like festivals or seawalls and so on it's usually about a year in the lead up of, of production um to kind of pull off an event of that sort of scale and um and there's there's just so many logistics involved behind the scenes of you know meetings with local council boards um applying for grants um just door knocking trying to like track down all the different landlords and you know the owners of these different buildings um back and forth liaison between artists and said owners of buildings for concepts at, at times um and i guess allegating different artists to different spaces and you know that's a really fun part that i enjoy is is it's much the same as i guess like curating an exhibition in a gallery space but like playing with the whole city or a town and picking and choosing artworks and muralists for certain buildings and you know what works um are most relevant in a certain area in terms of um whether they uh tie into like cultural context of you know what's happened in the history of that space with an artist that relates to that or um even just kind of balancing off works from a pure aesthetic point of view of what different artists produce. Um, but I think, I think uh, like probably in terms of like some of the struggles or the hurdles, I, I think what takes the most amount of time and effort is just trying to find the money, you know, um, just locking down funding, you know, that's, that's generally what, what it, you, you kind of have a budget and you know what it's going to take to produce an event of a certain scale. And then you, you can break all that down and spreadsheet it. And then it's just like, okay, where is this all coming from? And we've been very, um, very fortunate with the the two events that I ran here in Napier that um, Napier city council came on board. Um, they put forward a chunk of change, um, you know, not the full budget, but like, you know, maybe half the budget or, you know, sort of a percentage of the budget. And that's a really great head start. And then the rest is just like door knocking, a huge part of it is to kind of just being a salesman, you know, <laughs> you know, like just getting out there and um, speaking about what's important and why you're doing it and, um, you know, kind of promoting the project. Um, and that creates a real community behind it that, of, of people that want to get involved as well, um, whether they are financially contributing to, to pulling it off or whether it's like in-kind support or, you know, offering like cafes that offer up free coffee for artists or food or support in terms of lunches and things like that. And, um, which is a really beautiful thing, you know, I think like the fact that it kind of pulls a whole community t- together to get behind a project is, is massively rewarding because I guess it makes everybody feel like, you know, everybody's a part of it. Everybody's got stakes in it and, um, and has that sense of involvement and identity around it. And, you know, they can kind of walk around around the city and see these works and be like, Hey, I was, you know, like, I was a part of that happening. Um, and I met these people and, and, you know, um, that's sort of a chunk of your life that you're, you like, you're really engaged in, in something that is, is very community orientated, which is beautiful in itself. Um, yeah, I mean, mural, like murals in terms of just being an artist. Yeah. There's a, a lot of, it's just admin, you know, that behind the scenes kind of stuff, um, of just the back and forth, um, client consultation, you know, all that sort of stuff coming up with designs, um i've been pretty fortunate over the last couple of years to have some um, amazing clients where they've just sort of trusted my style and and what i do and that's that's really beautiful when you do have those projects that come through 
um, and you're kind of allowed that, that freedom of creative control. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that as well. Cause you know, you're, you're, you're kind of affecting a landscape for other people. Um, yeah, yeah. There's, there's many different angles that are, you know, um, uh, uh, struggles, but at the same time, like I said, like a, a far more rewarding, you know, the, the positive out, outweigh the negatives, like tenfold, a hundredfold, you know? Yeah. And what about you, Elizabeth? Um, well, again, same. I mean, everything with mural producing is kind of a challenge because, you know, there's so many things to, to take into consideration and that's, actually how we started um just you know thinking about all what the artist needs to do if they're doing it on their own so whether it's looking for a wall getting permits getting funding um convincing wall owners or clients or whatever i mean there's so much job that goes into uh, mural production so we were just like well if artists are doing that on their own um, they're, they're not using, you know, their immense talent to just be creative and, and spread their magic in the world. They're just like doing back end, you know, tough jobs. So that's what we our purpose. Um, and it is hard. It, it stays hard even after all these years and recognition, it's still super hard. Um, like my colleagues, um, said before, I mean, funding is never guaranteed. Um, there's never, ever anything guaranteed. Um, I mean, I, I was always thought that as we would get more recognition, it would be um, easier to find walls and convince wall owners. Well, it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, you know, there's no wall, there's no murals, uh, whether it's it's great funding and great talent. Um, it starts with a wall and that's a battle and it's a struggle. And it, there's a lot of work uh, into, you know, behind all of that. So it is a, a constant struggle. But like Jenna said, I mean, in the end, you stay with the good stuff and you know, after a year of, uh, or more two years and three years and four years, but after all this hard work, when it finally happens and you're just like, oh my God, once the scaffolding is up and artists are at work, it's just like, now I can just have my cocktail <laughs> and watch these amazing artists work. And, you know, it, it, and, and we see it with the community, um, even with community members that are against public art um that don't like visuals that don't like street art whatever um it's so rewarding when they come back and they say i apologize i was wrong or you know i didn't like the design but now in real i like it um that that makes it all all wor wor worthwhile yeah definitely a lot of work involved <laughs> um that's also why we we thought it, it was important to show or share this talk with everyone because um, people watch or see the murals or the exhibitions, but they don't see what's behind, which is a lot. <laughs> so yeah, I think it was really we thought it was really important that um, that's an important component of of as well here now. Um, all the all the machine behind these massive projects outside. Yeah, so thank you for all the hard work you've been doing in 15 years, wow. And and if I can add, um, you know, even if you want to bring uh, art to communities and, and offer um, a gift, what you think can be a gift, but it, it isn't always, and it's always, it's, it's not always perceived that way. So how do you engage in the dialogue and, um, you know, every person has an opinion about, about art and aesthetics and how do you make it, um, you know, have, have people adhere and be proud of, of the art, um, without having an individual conversation about, I like red or I like blue. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. 
Yeah, definitely. I um, I used to produce the street art festivals back home. I'm from Peru, so South America, which I was listening to you talking about um, the struggles to get the walls. For us there, it's, it's not as hard to get a wall as to get air, all the rest, like paint or like even the structures, you know, to rent a scaffold or a, or a lifter or a cherry picker or a grua, like a huge massive building one when you want to paint a building. That's, it's so expensive. Where do you get all those resources uh, from in like countries like Peru or like, you know, Chile in South America? We don't have big, big, um, public art grants that support um, street artists. So, um, yeah, that's why uh, you can see really good quality street art coming from South America because there are a lot of struggles the artists need to fight against in order to paint, and that's what makes them, like, pretty, pretty, I, I don't know how to pull it, maybe tough, maybe, like, you know, like, yeah, they can just go for it. <laughs> So yeah, it's really interesting to hear the different perspectives in different parts of the world. That's really interesting. I totally agree, Mire. Like some of the artists that I've seen come out of like South and Central America are just mind blowing, you know. And I think, I think that's because you you need to be really resilient and work with what you got. Um, and you know, much the same with like festival production and stuff as well. Like some of the gigs that we've done around the world, like I remember out in Bali, and you're just you're working with whatever you have, and there's no scaff available. You know, so we're we're out there with with local boys and kind of creating scaff rigs out of like bamboo and so on, and and that's what the locals paint on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 kind of a, it's adventure painting. It's great, <laughs> but you know, you, you're kind of working with what you have, um, and you you don't always have. We're very spoiled, and you know, I imagine Canada and New Zealand in terms of like having having these companies that have access equipment that's available that you can just hire. Um, but you know, the struggles come into like where the funding comes to be able to hire that equipment. And, um, but yeah, yeah, I think, I think you see so many artists around the world that produce these amazing works and, the, and it's, they're dedicated to what they do because, you know, they just have to make it happen. They have to make it work and you work with whatever you got available. Um, just, I think in Western civilization, Western countries, like, I mean, over here, you know, your, um, your restrictions are around, um, you know, kind of health and safety regulations and all of those sides of things to, to be able to produce them, you know, but yeah. It's really funny now that you mentioned the bamboo scaffold thing. Um, there is this artist in Peru, he's a genius desertor. He made a building, but in it's, it's a, like a side wall, maybe 30 meters wide per like 12 um, high. And he made it with like a huge extension pole and a little roller. <laughs> you see the video of him painting, and it's like having a huge rush on the building. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. I love that. <laughs> yeah. That was super interesting. Thank you. Thanks so much for your thoughtful responses. Um, yeah, and I think it's good for everyone who's interested in street art to know some of the challenges you will be faced with and how to overcome some of them, you know? And, um, yeah, I wanted to open up now to the, to Q and A's. If uh, anyone on Facebook is, uh, is there anyone who's asked any questions? Uh -huh. Oh, so yeah, we have here a few people watching us. I'm watching my cell phone because I'm watching our cell phone. Pretty like inception kind of thing. <laughs> So yeah, we have five more minutes and yeah, open to the questions in the Facebook page of Toy Poneke for those that are following. Um, we don't have any question yet, but I have a question for you. <laughs> Another question. Um, yeah, do you have any project or mural or exhibition that it's like the one you'll never stop thinking about and it's like, that's the one that, you know, you will always remember? or I don't know, the experience with the community or the artwork itself or the artists or what's um, that, that project for you? Oh man, um, I don't, yeah, we, we did a community um, sort of paint by numbers mural where um, it was, we, we went and uh, drew the mural, then we outlined each of the sections with the colors and kind of used color codes and then people could come and paint mm -hmm. um so that was pretty cool seeing like 
young, young kids and like um, older adults all taking part. It was pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, that was fun. We haven't done it again, though, but maybe one day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, every exhibition I, I love. So. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I think uh, so many, like so many, so many of the different projects, you know, kind of like it, all of them, <laughs> you know, um, I guess with, with festivals, if it's like an international event, it's like amazing just experiencing different culture and people and language and food and, um, you know, all of those incredible things that come with travel, which seems so alien in today's day and age right now, even just comprehending those experiences, um, with COVID and so on. So, um, but yeah, one, one really cool project I remember was out in Nusa Penida in, in Bali. Um, and we did a massive beach cleanup working with the local organization there, um, and collected, um, rubbish from, from a bunch of different beaches all over this island. Um, and then we kind of worked with the local school group and produced, um, a big sculptural piece with all these recycled materials. Um, and we made kind of an entire sort of this big reef with like a manta ray that kind of like was swimming over the, over the reef out of, you know, these recycled, well, just, just trash that was off, off the beach. So it was kind of cool, I guess, in terms of having like a, an environmental aspect to actually like cleaning up an area and then turning that into a work of art, which could stand for, you know, like quite a, a strong visual identifier for like a, you know, this is what's going on. This is what's affecting our oceans and your reefs. And, um, you know, that was, that was one really fun, fun project. Um, oh, there's just been, yeah, there's so, there's been so many over the years. I don't know if I could pinpoint kind of like, you know, one specific, one other specific project. I'm not too sure. <laughs> what about well, you? I'd, I'd say same for me. It's, it's like asking which, which is your favorite kid. Uh, <laughs> so like, kind of impossible mm. to do. Um, <laughs> However, um, I, I, I am really, really um, sensible to uh, Indigenous art um, and, and content and struggles. And we had a, a project a few years ago inviting youth from Cape Dorset, which is an Inuit community up north, uh, in Canada, really up north. And it has, it's a community that, that, um that has great great roots in um artwork and producing artwork since since 19th century and it's amazing and having these kids come to montreal they had never been in large city um you know seeing animals and trees and everything and they they worked on an original art piece with artists from um embassy eh, embassy of imagination and, um, you know, just having this experience with, uh, artists from, you know, indigenous communities that we rarely, uh, unfortunately have, you know, links with was truly a, a mind blowing experience. And, uh, since they were, they were teenagers, well, they painted the mural, but also they went to play in the park. We, brought them in museums and, you know, discovering Montreal. And it was truly an amazing experience. So that would be one of my favorite murals probably. And, you know, for the experience. Yeah, it sounds powerful. We do have a couple more questions from the people on Facebook. So Zoe asks, how do you use and also put aside your personal tastes in order to create early? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think, you know, when you're a curator, you definitely have um, so your, your own level of taste or your level of quality, but um, it's trying to look at things objectively and, and um, you know, uh, we've got a running joke that when we have an exhibition, like my personal painting, like one, that I don't like the bit the most will sell first and it's happened a few times and it's it blows my mind so I think with art um you just can never tell what people will like um it's just so, so subjective and there is something for everyone like there's 
it might not be your cup of tea, but it's going to be someone. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. That's why I love, I love art. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's also subjective. Eh? It, it definitely, definitely is a hard one. Cause I think everybody has bias about, you know, specific artists that they, you love their work and you're really excited to work with them. Um, but yeah, I think, I think maybe having an, an array of different people with different perspectives that are kind of on a panel that can, you know, help with that curatorial process, you know, um, I guess, um, you know, with a, yeah, you, you kind of have a balanced list of different people or different artists you kind of, you, you want to work with, and then that's bounced off against other people and you get their perspectives as to why or why not, you know, they would benefit the project. Um, yeah, it's a hard one though, eh? It's a real hard one. Cause I think ultimately like it does come into play too, you know, it's like, um, yeah, you, you know, you want to create exciting work with artists that you love their work, you know, like, I think it's, a, it is a big part of it. Um, mm. yeah. But yeah, I think just bouncing it, bouncing it against other people for other people's opinions. Um, and, and exactly that thinking that, you know, like, uh, even if something isn't your favorite work or, um, or whatever, like, other people will love that and it's it's you know everything is received differently from different people um well same here in montreal i mean we're um like since i said we're you know it, it's not about your personal taste um uh, it does come into effect obviously but you know not all the murals that we produce I, I, I love. Um, and you're always saying when you're accompanying, um, you know, financial partners or city elected officials and stuff, it's, it's not like, it's not in your living room. So you're not, um, it's not the same choices. So it's not about personal taste. It, it's about what makes sense where, you know, with the architecture and with the history and with, um, it's site specific. So that's what's important. And like, since I was saying, it's affecting landscape for other people. So that, that needs to be the main concern way more than my personal taste. Um, but, but it is a, a, a fine line. Mm. Yeah, so interesting to, to listen all the different perspectives, but at the same time, they're pretty similar. So it's really, really cool. And the last question from Jackie, um, well, I suppose this is for local. Um, how could a young person under 15 in Wellington get into it? Any suggestions? Oh, man. Um, I, would, I would say, like, if, if they can find... Um, you know, an artist that they feel is approachable and just start that conversation with them. Um, you know, go out and watch someone paint. Um, we we had this uh, Slap City. It was a crew of sticker makers at Fixate and um, people would see it online and bring their kids down and see if they they wanted to do it. And just having that community, like a group of people um, that – you know, might be able to take you out and and do it sort of safely. I guess, yeah. That's my opinion. Just just head up, head up, artists. You're pretty friendly. Oh, sorry, it's my phone. <laughs> oh my god, sorry. That's <laughs> Nathan. Oh my goodness. Anyways, <laughs> what about you, Cynthia? Would you have any suggestions for like young youngsters who wanted to go into the street? For, for young painters, that, young artists that want to get into it, I think like, um, yeah, I mean, I guess either approaching other artists like Jenna said, or I think maybe, I, I think it's really important also to like hone your craft um, and, you know, spend some time like really developing your work and, um, and you know, whether that's say like, uh, I don't know if you're, if you're living in a flat or whatever, or you're living, if you're like young and still living at home or something, maybe if your parents are supportive and you have a fence in your backyard that you can paint and practice on, or even like, be like, let's go to Mitre 10 and buy a couple of sheets of plywood and, you know, like yeah. nail those up to a wall and a fence and have that, that as a, like a bit of a practice wall that you can, you can experiment on and, and create and, and try and develop some different things. And then I think, once you're feeling confident with that, then you can go out and approach different businesses or wall owners or, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think like some cities have spaces that are available just to go and paint and experiment and play. Um, 
I think when I, when I came up, I was, you know, painting skate parks and under bridges and, you know, kind of these sort of different spaces or, you know, doing paste ups and going out and just putting those up around town um, and just kind of got involved and just got into it. Um, found like-minded friends that were involved and, you know, that we were keen to kind of get amongst it as well. And um, I think getting involved in the community like that really helps. Um but yeah, I think before just going out and like hitting walls and painting, painting shit, like, <laughs> you know, maybe developing, developing your skills a little bit or, um, or yeah, I, I know down in Wellington, there's the skate park down on the waterfront there. That's got like some free legal spots that you can paint. There's those panels there that are in front of the skate park. Um, and you could, you could jump on those and give them a go. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that like, if you're really into it, it's a natural progression that you put the time and the effort into it and it develops. And then one thing leads to another and, and you will end up getting walls and getting, you know, getting spots that you can paint. And yeah. So I think practice, honing skills, and then putting it out there and seeing how it's received. So everybody just heard, um, Tinsa? Really good, really good suggestions, I reckon. <laughs> those are really good spots to start painting as well in Wellington here. Yeah. How about you, Elizabeth? Any suggestions? Honestly, from the other side of the world, same. My peers are right. Uh, like anything that you're passionate about, if you want to make, make, you know, into it a uh, formal, you know, way of expression and, and of, of job, you need to work on it. There's no other way around it. So practice, practice, practice. And like Jenna said, I agree with that too. Find a mentor, um, you know, find, find a peer that can help you out and, and bring you out there and teach you ropes. But yeah, it's like anything. You're going to be good if you practice and you work hard. That's, there's no way around that. Mm. So thank you. Um, so this is our panel discussion of street art producers and curators at Toponeki. Um, thank you so much to all our panelists. It was a super interesting conversation. I'm sure that um, people at home will agree. I, I was very captivated. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, come and check out here and out until April 22nd, just next door in this building. Um, if you can't be there in person, there's also some links on our Instagram here.end.out, um, where there's a virtual exhibition you can visit as well. Um, and we're going to be posting more and more photos in the, the, up until the end of the show as well. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for everyone who has come by already. And, um, yeah, Tenakoto Katoa, merci beaucoup. All the best. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> thanks. thanks, the team behind the hammer as well. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate it, guys. I like to take a picture of them. <laughs> yeah, it was really nice to talk to you, to meet you, Elizabeth. I, um, we, mm. we have never met before. And Jenna, thank you for joining us. Thanks, uh, I hope I see you soon. <laughs> I know, same. <laughs> That's a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Bye. Have a Bye. Nice day and Bye. Night. Bye. 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 Bye.